All right, it is good to be back. The week in Spain. I'm not any tanner. You would never known I had gone to Spain had I not tweeted about it, posted on Instagram. Lovely time in Valencia. Uh, I now have a La Liga team. Lots of more football knowledge, but everyone is here, of course, for American football. And everyone is here to listen to the Sultan of Spressies, Dakota Randall, newly minted at the Pro Football Network. I don't know whether you like the title of being the Pro Football Network writer now based in New England or the Sultan of Spressies, meaning espresso martinis. Right off the top, I need you to pick one. Rest of your life, which one are you going by? The Sultan of Spressies, absolutely. That's <laughs> I'll take that one for the rest of my life without a doubt. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Dakota uh, has been in this podcast before. We were last seen, you know, recording with Zach Cox. We were in Boca. It was right before the 2022 season, a time when everyone was full of very cautious optimism that, of course, went down the drain, much like the 2022 season did. Uh, you are not drinking here today, but you are wearing an espresso martini shirt and your love of this drink has infected the rest of the beat. I say this because we will not speak of this again in the podcast, but it needs to be said at the front end and we will move on to football the rest of the way. What we are going to cover today uh, to start are all the things that I missed while I was away, and we have not had a podcast in more than a week. We are going to discuss meeting the coordinators, which we did on Wednesday, officially in press conferences, and then off the record with a quote-unquote happy hour, no spressies to be found there, and then why the rebuild in listening to them and also just observing the team with our eyes is going to take a lot longer, I think, than people expect. And maybe it'll be faster, but the process, the work ahead is so deep and so wide this is a whole overhaul that I even think I underestimated. Uh, and then a little to Jeremiah son, because we just got to chat with him and he gives you a scouting group on LA. But off the top, uh, Dakota, you were all three years at Nesson as a beat writer? Uh, yeah, spent the last three years on the beat at Nesson. Uh, was there for the last seven years. That was a, you know, it was a great ride. Um, you know, won't get too much into sort of what happened at the end. It just, it kind of is what it is. Uh, but, you know, I'm pretty fortunate that, uh, the pro football network thing came together quickly. Um, it's something I'm excited about. And certainly, you know, when you're in a transition period, uh, you know, you'd never know if you're going to land in a place that you can still, you know, kind of get the juice from, if you know what I mean. Um, and so uh, it's a good spot. It enables me to uh, to cover the league more, which I think is something I wanted to do instead of being just so uh, in the Patriots bubble, kind of broaden the knowledge a little bit. And also I kind of have the freedom to be around the Patriots uh, as much as I want, um, which is something I plan on taking advantage of um, to continue trying to report on the Patriots. So I'm looking forward to the season and, and staying around. Good. Well, you are a better man than I because I said this when Zach Cox was on. Uh, I said, Nesson, you fucked up. Uh, <laughs> laying off Patriots beat writer the day before Belichick predictably parted ways with the organization. Just a Hall of Fame, bad timing move. You now put in a different position. I'm not going to ask you to speak on this. But Nesson management, guys, <laughs> this is unbelievable uh on your part but you moved on you're at a better place you'll have more opportunities good luck to them okay the week that was we have four topics here i told you i want you to pick one but don't tell me i am going to do the same we will leave the other two alone and then move on to more pressing matters so while i was away bill o'brien got introduced at boston college and he told everyone that he could have stayed in new england i think this flew under the radar a little bit but he left to let gerard mayo hire his own staff number two matthew slater retired 16 years, 13 as a captain, 10 as a pro bowler, two-time all-pro, uh, expected, but nonetheless, big news. Lawrence Guy, Adrian Phillips, did not retire, but they got released. Patriots now are up to nearly 70 million, 7-0 in cap space, second most in the league, even when they cut or restructure J.C. Jackson, that will go to about 80. And then lastly, as I mentioned, the coordinators introduced on Wednesday, all by happy hour, something that just, I, I, <laughs> I would love to have seen Belichick's face, if that was ever proposed by the PR department, as this was, and followed through successfully by Gerard Mayo, uh, and what that just kind of says to you. So of those four topics, what are we going to hit on first? Yeah, uh, for me, I wanted to kind of get into the Matthew Slater thing. Um, yep. It's probably not the juiciest topic, but, you know, we were you, you were wondering, you know, where will his impact be felt the most? Uh, and I don't necessarily, I don't think it's going to be on the field. I don't, I don't think that's a hot take. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, as we saw last season or the last few seasons, Matthew Slater alone uh, isn't enough uh, to make a special teams group play well. Uh, and obviously special teams aren't nearly, uh, at least the value of that position isn't what it once was in the NFL. You know, I think it's absolutely going to be felt off the field. And you know, one of my takeaways from last season was really how the Patriots handled that that awful season. And of course, behind the scenes, there was more finger pointing. Um, there were things that popped up throughout the year, whether it be Trent Brown kind of going rogue at the end, the stuff with Jack Jones, the stuff with J.C. Jackson. 
um, you know, that was emblematic of a team where where they were in the standings. So they weren't completely without that stuff. But I think, you know, the, how well they were able to keep it together publicly, uh, relatively speaking, I think was a testament not only to Belichick, but I think to the top leaders in that locker room. And I think that, you know, primarily being Matthew Slater. Um, and so without him, you know, where do the Patriots, especially the younger players in the locker room, turn uh, to see who's setting the tone from a prof professionalism standpoint if things kind of go sideways this year, which they absolutely could. Uh, you know, there's still leaders left, whether it be David Andrews, uh, guys like Jonathan Jones, other guys who have been around, Dietrich Wise, Juwan Bentley. But I think Slater really set that tone from a professionalism standpoint and how to handle yourself like a professional during adversity. Uh, and without him, you know, I think that's just a huge role to fill. So Matthew Slater, look, I, I mean, I rattle up the numbers. 16 years, 13 as a captain, 10 as a pro bowler, yada, yada. It, it cannot be captured in numbers. And, and obviously few human beings, if, if, if any, can be in terms of their career and their production and what they meant to the game. But he's just someone, on a, I wish I had better stories to share. But as someone who ever, however you cross path with Matthew Slater, you were made better because of it. Like this guy was a pillar in the locker room. He was an institution unto himself. All of the words that flowed from Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick and, you know, the um, all the ex-teammates, all of that rings true. Like, that's a time, you know, when you're reading the career obit, you know, er oh, you get the best version of them. And it's always a little flowery. It's over the top. Like, we've all been to funerals. That's how it goes. Every single word of that was true. Nothing you could say was over the top about this guy who could be a pastor if he wants. He could work in any kind of capacity. You go to him for advice. He would always stop the chat with the media, which is not a good barometer of how good a person is. You can tell us to F off and be a saint. That's fine. But he always took the time and was grateful and had incredible perspective and deep thought and care for everyone around him who, like I said, by extension, made him better, uh, made them better. And so he just, I I'm going to miss him. I mean, he was a pillar of that locker room and had a, a locker that was close to the door that led into the weight room, which will be changed now. They move things around. But you knew you could go by him and either stop and say hello, ask a question, anything that you needed, teammate, media, PR member, because he had been there and seen things. And I think this gets lost a little bit. Since 2008, okay, we all do the guys who have won multiple rings. He followed the perfect 16-0 and team. He was the last link to that part of the dynasty, even if he didn't win a Super Bowl. But he was teammates with Mike Vrabel. Teddy Bruschi at the end. Okay, Rodney Harrison in 2008 and understood what those guys meant. And now you've lost that link to the past. So, again, I wish I had better, more flowery words from Matthew Slater. Just know everything that's been said. Ranks true. Yeah, and I would just, you know, for me, he was, you know, like a a young or inexperienced reporter's dream, right? Because, you know, when I joined the beat, I didn't have a ton of other beat writing experience. I kind of came into it a little bit late in the game. And he was just someone who you felt like you could go up and ask anything to, which just, again, that's not, doesn't translate to anything on the field, but just from a selfish perspective, you know, it made my job a lot easier. And I felt like I, I could ask him really anything, no matter how tough it was. I mean, I remember I asked him about Bill Belichick's job status after the Jets game in week three this year, which in my mind, I'm like, is this too early? Wow. Uh, and he always handled all those questions, you know, with total class. And one of my favorite things was that maybe he was just really good at, that sort of putting on a front and if so it was the most convincing front ever but you know he would say things like you know I'd say thank you and he would say always great talking to you and speaking with you always good to see you and I'm like I don't know if he actually means that well that's, true, and that's a perfect example though so they win that game and I remember talking to Matthew after that because I had asked him after hearing from another teammate again they barely beat the Jets but it's their first win you avoid going to 0-3 who had told me about this speech that he had delivered on Friday and everyone was like, hey, Slate's feeling the heat. It's like this urgency. He gave the speech on Friday. really meant a lot to us. You know, they eke by the Jets or by the Hail Mary. But you go up to him and say, what do you think about Bill's job status? Nice win. Yeah, but your coach might be canned in like uh, three and a half months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I asked him like, I, you know, it was the sort of the, hey, you know, there was and we there was talk that week that like if they lost that game and went to 0-3, we're going to, Belichick's job is going to be a national conversation. And of course, it wound up being one regardless. You know, he gave like a full long answer about, you know, kind of the same sort of stuff we heard the rest of the year about how they're behind him and they have full comments in him and all that. But he didn't blow it off. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and again, like totally made you truly believe that he actually enjoyed speaking to you in the locker room after an ugly win or after a bad loss. Like it always was the same. Um, and it, it never wavered. It was so consistent. And I, you know, I definitely admire that about him for sure. Okay, um, because I'm a dictator on this podcast, I will get to break the own rules that I set where I said you would pick a topic 
and then I would go because my choice was going to be Matthew Slater. We have to honor the great number 18, who should also go into the Hall of Fame, by the way. Yeah. Now I'm going to quickly hit all of the three other topics because I have small thoughts and then we'll move on. Uh, Bill O'Brien, I said on this podcast and other places, was, you know, as I understood it, the favorite to remain as the offensive coordinator due to his contract, due to his relationship with the Crafts. Uh, and, and he could start over like the rest of the roster could when Gerard Mayo took over. Obviously, he left, but his comments speak to that standing of where if he wanted to come back, which he told reporters at Boston College, he could have. And so we're not counting wins here, but when you want to understand why he left or part of that decision making, um, there it is right there from the mouth of the horse. Secondarily, Lawrence Guy and Adrian Phillips, obvious cut candidates going to the last year of their jobs. Phillips hardly played on defense last year. Lawrence Guy, there were say rumblings uh was not the happiest of campers even after the contract was not settled when he was holding out of minicamp and then comes back unlikely to return some thought he might retire obviously it sounds like he's going to go on and try to play elsewhere but jc jackson is the next domino to fall as far as the cap which i mentioned would put them at 80 million roughly which should lead the league in cap space not as important as cash but still notable lastly the coordinators meeting with the media on wednesday standard operating procedure really the happy hour was different and I, Mayo said in his opening statement, I don't say this to give the media any more credit or shine or spotlight than we deserve or need. But he said it's important to him that the relationship between the coaches and the media is in a good place. It's also smart of him as a first year yes. head coach who's going to make mistakes and learn on the job to start off on a good foot and butter us up a little bit. I'm not saying that this is I'm not taking sort of a cynical stance here, but. You understand why he did that with a bunch of new coaches coming in here who realize there's a lot of work to do. Let's at least gain a curry a little bit of favor, you know, meet, hang out all off the record, which we did after these press conferences. Nothing can be said. The contents of those conversations will stay in that room. But a smart move I thought about in addition to it marks a new era because Belichick would never have done this except at gunpoint. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, it was an easy win. Uh, not only was it an easy win, but it was also like it was beneficial. You know, I mean, it. it probably more so for us than them. Um, but, you know, it definitely was a help. Uh, and again, it just sort of, it, it, it hopefully gets just all to a place where there's just less anxiety surrounding the team, the way we cover the team. Um, and I think that was a good first step uh, and, and a smart one, like you said. And just a place to connect as people, right? Like these guys are, are largely staying in a hotel near the stadium. They're looking for houses. They're looking for their new favorite restaurants what it's like around here. So I'm a guy that they know is media, but you connect on things other than football. And I think that's a great place to start with any relationship, but especially dealing with reporters on our end is like, this is what I'm about in addition to what I do for a living. Um, but that's enough about that. All right, on to the rebuild, because this is going to be deeper and wider than even I expected. Here are the reasons why after we take a quick break. Get your buckets with your first bet at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams, quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit fanduel.com slash Boston and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Okay, three parts to this roster. Rebuild. Uh, well, roster is number one. Uh, the second part is the coaching staff. And then we have the culture, which I wrote about here today. Where do you want to start? And Well, first of all, let me back up. Do you agree with my take that this, this rebuild is going to be deeper and wider and more thorough than we expected, just given Mayo was following in the footsteps of his only head coach in an organization where he played and grown up? First of all, uh, I need to preface this by saying, that I might not be the most reliable source because, and, and, and Zach Cox was in this with me, I think I picked the Patriots in every game last season except for the home win against the Buffalo um, and I think one of the other ones later in the year. So I, I for whatever reason, I talked myself into them having a chance in all of those games. Um, and I, I kind of stand by all of that. Um, but And so I actually believe that it, it's it's all relative, right? It's like, what do you what, rebuild to what? Like what they were a semblance of what they were previously that's may never happen right uh getting back into super super bowl contention in this nfl uh or just getting back into being in the playoffs um and if it's just getting back into the playoffs i actually don't uh, I, I think it could be a little bit quicker than, than people realize but obviously there are some massive variables that have to break their way 
So that's a good point. And I will define rebuild as this, not necessarily the path back, but what does the car look like that's driving you there? Like, are you going from the tank that Commander Belichick drove down the street? Okay. And you're, you're not getting in the way of the tank. The tank makes up its mind. It's going to go where it wants to go. Is this going to have a tighter turn? Like, how different is the car? And in my conversations, in my understanding and listening to these coaches on Wednesday, is that this is going to be so different because the most powerful man in New England right now, no longer obviously, is Bill Belichick. It's not even Gerard Mayo. It's Elliot Wolf, who has spent, as we've documented, 14 years in Green Bay, two with the Browns as an assistant GM, has different ideas, beliefs, and philosophies that he couldn't fully implement in New England when he was just a consultant and then director of scouting. He now has the power, and you've seen that with the coaching staff, with the front office, and we'll soon see with free agency in the draft. So that's why I say this is going to be different. But let's start with the coaching staff because – the, Jeremy Springer, happy birthday, first of all, turned 35 today, February 22nd, the day I write a column, the first sentence of which is Jeremy Springer is 34. Factually incorrect right off the bat. Thank you to Jeremy Springer's parents for just, you know, today. Uh, Jeremy Springer, 35 years old, used the word love three times when I asked him at the end of his press conference why he was the right man for the job. I care about people. I'm about people. That to me speaks to, you know, a guy who's younger, has a lot of energy. What was just your initial impression, I would say, as a way to get into this conversation of Springer as kind of embodying this culture shift and change? Well, first of all, you're totally justified in not knowing about the birthday stuff because he's like one of uh, maybe the only coach throughout all this that I can't find anything on unless it's on a team bio. I don't think he has a Wikipedia page. So I think I have actually looked for the birthday throughout this too and I couldn't find it. So Wikipedia, like you, also not the most reliable source. Your words, not mine. Not, right. <laughs> mine I, know, I, I do take their their birthdays as gospel. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, a, a ton of energy. Almost, you know, uh, reminded me of Cam Court a little bit, but more concise. Um, but I, I think, you know, he's young. You can tell. he It doesn't come across as fake or force. I think that's just who he is. Um, and I think it, it sort of is in keeping with what it feels like a lot of the people they brought in are, have been described as, as good culture guys, good culture fits. It seems like he sort of fits that mold. Um, and it just seems like he'll be a good fit for guys like Brennan Schooler, who he has a, a history with. Uh, I believe he said at Arizona, um, you know, is, you know, a similar sort of personality. Um, and, 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 you know, even Chad Ryland, if he's back, has some of that. I just think, uh, you know, I think his personality will be a good fit. Uh, in that room, you know, provided some of those players are back. We don't know how that's going to go. Um, but again, this is a guy, and this is kind of also the thing with the staff, you know, it hasn't proven much. He's, you know, you, you almost maybe would have felt better if Tom Quinn, the assistant, was the special teams coordinator based on the experience. So we'll just have to see. But uh, from a personality and an energy standpoint, he certainly checks those boxes. Well, and the reason I bring him up, as I said, is a way to get into this conversation about culture. And we'll go back and circle through the staff and we'll go through the roster, which we've talked about in this podcast before, just how barren it is. And you're looking at the Temple players, blue chip talent, whatever you want to call them. They're just not very many of them. I bring him up, not because everyone wants to hear about special teams. It's just that love part, trust, relationships. The reason that Demarcus Covington, as Drod Mayo said, and this is not the entire reason, said he got promoted is... You knew he was ready for this because of the way he connects with players, mind, body, and spirit. Alex Van Pelt, a relationship guy, which Mayo says, quote, I fundamentally believe in. Okay, so it's not the excess knows. It's not the hard work and the work ethic. It's your approach, your philosophy with players, and that you want to connect with them personally. And so that is the starkest shift that we will see. Like the flying Elvis is going to be on the helmet. They're going to run Belichick's defense. But everything else, all of Bill's fingerprints are being wiped off here because of this, you know, happily miserable, as Julian Edelman put it in 2020, militaristic kind of operation out the window. In comes the kumbaya of the 2024 Patriots led by Dry Mayo and these coordinators. But how much does that matter? Because the Patriots did a lot of winning, happily miserable. And however the term is now with this kumbaya approach, my word's not exactly theirs, how much does it matter? Or is it just a change and we have to wait and see? No, I mean... I think it does matter, right? I, I think I, you know, for a while was someone who said, you know, I kind of defaulted to Belichick on that and said the results speak for themselves. It doesn't matter and said that, you know, maybe, yeah, he can't connect to some of the younger players and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, he'll be, you know, he can find the guys who do fit his system and in, in what he's looking for and it'll work out. But uh, the results at the end, you know, kind of prove that it had become antiquated. 
And I think you have a not insignificant amount of former players, I think, you know, including the likes of Devin McCourty. Um, and we've seen some of these guys talk about it in, in the Dynasty series, um, you know, that it, his way of doing it and that military like style, you know, like you said, piloting the tank uh, and just <laughs> barreling over everyone, uh, you know, it, it, it probably doesn't work with with today's athlete, with today's uh, with today's generation. you got to have a softer touch, not necessarily a softer touch. It's football, right? Like you, there has to be some of that. Um, some of that toughness and in, in demanding uh, culture in there. Uh, but, you know, definitely, you know, more of, like you said, the kumbaya feeling um, and everybody pulling in the same direction, you know, the the, the family style. You know, I think um, we might, uh, fans and all of us might kind of roll our eyes at that after, you know, what we saw from Belichick and the Patriots over those 20 years. But I think in this day and age, I think it's it's a necessary shift for them. I mostly agree with you in that I think what it is, and the easiest analogy I've made this about the Patriots draft classes from 21 to 22 is that you know you break up with someone and the next partner you seek is the exact opposite. Like you don't want to deal with the crazy girl who's a ton of fun after 11 o'clock and you don't know where the night is going to go. So you go with the girl who's going to be in bed by 10 and it reads and knits and has three cats. And that's all well and fine, but it's only because you're not going to run. my you. life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, we all know who you dated before Christina. I just I just described her apparently. Um, so Christina might be a little bit of both. If we're, if I'm I'm just going to hazard a guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the reason you do that is not because it's necessarily a better option, but you're going to avoid the problems that were created by that last relationship or that last coaching staff. And so the way I put it today in my column is that you know that that approach, that militaristic attitude, which became very Machiavellian behind the scenes and infighting and media leaks among the coaching staff and pointing fingers and laying blame, broke the offensive staff in 2022. And it broke it again in 2023. And Mayo gave very subtle reference to this when I asked him at the end, how much input did Alex Van Pell have? He goes, I think it's very important that an offensive coordinator be able to fill out his offensive staff, which Bill O'Brien did not get to do in 2023, which led him to tighten the circle bring everyone closer to him, run the meetings himself because he didn't trust the coaches around him, basically. And so Alex Van Pelt is not going to make those same mistakes. Everyone is going to be on the same page. What does that page say? How does it read? What are those X's and O's look like? Are they as good as Bill O'Brien or Josh McDaniels? Who knows? But I think it's a necessary shift in that you need to be a little bit more unified than, as Mayo put it, siloed. And so that's an improvement. It does not, however, mean, though, that when the clock strikes 10.01, and your girl's asleep, and you want to go out, but you don't have a new problem. Oh, I can't do this anymore because these are the different issues facing the Patriots, whether they're schematic or whether they're kind of trust with this staff or their experience, because it is a young staff that I think largely is underwhelming, but they're at least going to fix the old problems and patch those holes in the ship. Where might they spring next? Because none is perfect, no ship, no staff. Who knows? But I, I think you're right. It's a necessary positive shift for this generation of players and to fix the problems of the last two years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, listen, if you're if you're uh lacking for energy at 10 p.m., this one fix, espresso martinis, right? Espresso martini, there it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get it there. Uh, but I, you know, I agree. And I, I think, you know, ideally, if you're drawing it up, probably the, the perfect scenario for the Patriots from a coaching staff and a and a culture standpoint would be, you know, a marriage of the two, a marriage of, you know, a, some some middle ground between what Belichick was, because we, you know, you can't just Say we're we're going to completely abandon everything we learned in the press and the standard set by the greatest head coach in football history. No matter how antiquated some of those practices became, but on the other side, we need to we need to move close, far closer uh, to where the game clearly is going these days. Both from a schema schematic standpoint, from a culture standpoint, just what the players want and need uh, in this day and age. And so, hopefully, the players can find a middle ground. And I think they can because you know there were some holdovers from Belichick. There were guys like Mayo who were, were trained by him. There's also a lot of youth on the staff. You have a ton of experience uh, with guys like Alex Van Pelt, uh, Tom Quinn, like I mentioned, Ben McAdoo. So I do think they have a, a potentially interesting blend of old, young, experienced, inexperienced guys who have a uh, background with Belichick, guys who don't. Um, and so hopefully that can allow them to, to achieve the best of both worlds. But, you know, it, it, it'll be tough for sure. Yeah, it's well said. Uh, and of course, I get an angry email right now about the column. I said the Patriot way was good for six Super Bowls. And now the idea is to bring in a bunch of people pleasers. Come on. Uh, <laughs> that, that person, Michael uh, G, feels probably like a lot of people listening. The difference, of course, in those six Super Bowls and what happened when they go 29 and 39 was not only infighting and all of the dysfunction we documented at the Herald, but the roster talent started to drain as well as the brain drain in the front office. And so this is the most quantifiable 
part of the rebuild that I think when you look at, and we'll go quickly through the roster and then go into the actual coaching staff and schematically the things that are going to change, where I say again, the car is going to look so different for the Patriots and however fast they get back to contention. I'm just saying it's going to be a different vehicle, culture, belief system that gets them there. Now, the roster is going to determine those schematics, so let's start there again. The offense, to review, no starting quarterback on the roster. You have a good running back. It's in a contract year. Uh, if Kendrick Bourne walks in free agency, you have no capable wide receiver ones or wide receiver twos. You also have zero tight ends under contract, and both your offensive tackles are going to hit free agency. Now, staying with that for a second, Mac Jones. Alex Van Pelt said everything is on the table if he returns. I, last night on television, said, okay, if Mac Jones is this pen in my hand, this pen is now on the table. There goes Mac Jones. <laughs> Okay, and I threw it behind me. Are you of, of my belief, or you think he might actually stay in 2024? I mean, I, I think two things, you know, a little bit of both. I think there, there's a chance he stays uh, this season, just you know, maybe just to provide depth, or if, if maybe do a quarterback battle with a veteran in training camp or something like that. But like them hit, totally hitching their wagons to him as, as the starter, uh, I there's I just don't see. It. There's no possible way that you can't do that. There's no reason to believe that would be a good idea for them to do. It would be malpractice. Um, but if this story ends with them, uh, it, whether it's Kirk Cousins or whoever, uh, and they want to bring back Mac Jones and and just take a flyer, see if he's able to 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 refine himself in training camp uh, or accept a backup role, maybe. But I also don't see that happening either. I think at the end of the day, uh, the trade makes the most sense for both sides. Smart man. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more about Mac when we have Dakota's bad uh, take segment coming up uh, to close this off. <laughs> Uh, on the quarterback, though, this is worth mentioning, even though, look, you need to be professional, objective, stick by the facts. But if I were sitting back in maybe a talk radio capacity or I was just doing this podcast before the press conferences, I would have made up bingo cards, which would have said the defensive coordinator is going to say aggressive. The offensive coordinator is going to say explosive. When asked about quarterbacks, he's going to say accuracy and decision making. And lo and behold, all three of those hit amid other squares. But Alex Van Pelt's new quarterback, he wants a smart tough and a leader that's an exact quote then of course the accuracy and decision making so if folks want to know look i don't put a ton of stock into that i think it's obvious i think those are good traits don't get me wrong there's just not might a describe of... mac jones as a rookie just not mac jones of the last two years yes well said um that's just i i wouldn't read a ton into that as far as the draft goes or free agency on defense again just to review quickly and then we'll get into uh ben pelt scheme and covington uh lawrence guy and adrian phillips out the door Kyle Duggar and Josh Uche are standing in the doorway going into free agency. Matt Judon, Jonathan Jones, and Christian Barmore are in contract years. And so that's what the defense looked like. It's not as much shift as the offense. And I think you'll see some of those guys obviously come back. Um, but that's what you're dealing with as far as the roster, the rebuild. How different will this team look from the end of 2023 to September 2024? So going back to the offense now, Alex Van Pelt, said that the offense will be similar to what the Browns ran when he was the offensive coordinator there for four years. He also said the running game, whether it's more gap schemes, pulling guards, tackles and such, or zone schemes, everyone going largely in one direction or inside zone with double teams largely up the middle, will depend on the type of offensive lineman they get. So this is a sandwich where, okay, it's going to be a certain kind of meat. I know what the bread is, but I don't know exactly everything that's going in the middle. Was this good news or bad news to you that they're running the Brown system, but they don't know exactly what's going to be in that system yet? Yeah, I, I, I had, I thought that was an interesting point too. Um, you know, I think it, it's easy to say that you know wh whoever would have want who who sat back and said, well, you know what, I want this off season is to do what the Browns did. Um, you know, I, I think that's a perfectly fair take. Uh, but at the at the end of the day, and I also that to look at what the Patriots did to that Browns offense in their last two meetings, um, and think that you know how could they have possibly been so impressed with what Stefanski and 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 Van Pelt did in those games that they wanted to hire one of them as the offensive coordinator? But you know, I, I think where I ultimately come down on this um, is I I do think it's encouraging because I think the West Coast offense is is, is tried and true; it can work. Uh, but I have you know my two primary concerns are you know number one it. it it relies on you know receivers uh, or any of the pass catchers to be very precise with their route running, uh, and that I think was a huge issue for the Patriots. Not, I don't think it was a huge issue for the Patriots over the last few years. And so, like, do they have the coaches in place to correct those issues? I, I, we don't know, right? Can Tyler Hughes do that? Can Can Tyquan 
Uh, I almost said Thornton Underwood do that. Uh, we don't know. I think that that's a huge question mark. You know, can they coach up the players to play within this system at a high level? Um, I, I, again, that was the big problem the last couple of years. And then the other one is, you know, if, if, if you were hoping for something like the, uh, the McVay system or, or, or McDaniel or whatever, you know, that's not what this is. And it's not explosive. It's not going to be particularly quick hitting. And so it's not a, a system that's really built to play from behind. And the Patriots might not be a very good team this year. And they could be behind in a lot of these games. And so are they going to be, if, if that bears out, are they going to be in a position with this scheme uh, to play from behind and, and eke out some of these close games? Uh, I think that that's a fair question too. It is. And look, I, I like a lot about the Brown scheme in the system, but I like you have some issues. Let's start in the positive though. This was a top 10 scoring offense last year, despite starting five different quarterbacks, including Joe Flacco, as we all saw, PJ Walker, Baker May, oh, not Baker Mayfield, Deshaun Watson, okay, Jacoby Brissett, and then some Jamoke I'm forgetting. Can't wait to find out that I'm an idiot for forgetting this person in the comments on YouTube. We'll see you a little bit later. Um, they also are versatile. And Alex Van Pelt has said things like, you know, we'll tailor it to the talent that we have. We don't know the talent that we have, so we're going to find that out later. But when you look at the rate at which they ran these gap schemes, again, you're looking for pulling guards. That's a motion. Um, they were number one in the league last year. And this followed three years ago when this was a zone-heavy running team. So Scott Peters, who comes over as an ex-offensive lineman, assistant offensive line coach with Cleveland in the last four years, is going to be able to coach multiple schemes. And that foundation of the offensive line set everything up in Cleveland. If they get a good line, I'm talking top 10, top 12, on when it comes back or you get a good left tackle uh, or draft another one, whatever happens, you can move the ball. You'll unlock a lot of possibilities the way the Patriots couldn't the last couple of years. But the Browns had a great offensive line. It is far from a guarantee that the Patriots will even have a good one moving forward. And so the fact that, as you said, you don't play from behind very well. And this is all predicated on having guys who can just mow down the middle of the field or a defensive line is an issue when maybe you're not necessarily equipped for that. So there are good and part, uh, there, there are good and bad parts here. The other issue, I won't say issue, difference between the scheme is the staff that's putting it into place. 11 offensive assistants. That number matches almost the entire number of assistant coaches the Patriots had last year. Offense, defense, and special teams. What do you make of the bigger staff, which Gerard Mayo explained by saying, look, that's how you have to do business in the modern NFL. No, I, I mean, I think it's it, it's it's partly that, what he said, right? Like, that you have to do that in the modern NFL. But I also think it's sort of an acknowledgement that this is a first-year head coach who maybe is coming, is into this job a little bit earlier Uh you know, then, then, then he was qualified for, or maybe then the Patriots believed that he was ready for. So I, you know, I think surrounding him with as many different voices uh, and, and levels of experience, different people to bounce ideas off of, and especially, you know, these guys like, like Ben McAdoo, um, you know, I think that's really important. So, you know, I, I think it's a little bit of both that it's, yeah, they want a, a full staff to really accomplish the things that they want to, but I think it's also about surrounding Mayo uh, with as many voices as possible to help him out uh, as he you know gets ready for his first year as a head coach, perhaps earlier uh, than anyone thought he would have done it. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I talked about my favorite hires with Fitzy and we got to meet some of these guys again at the happy hour, not going to disclose anything that was talked about, but for the folks at home, when you hear 11, it's a lot and it matters who's filling those roles. Again, Drod said the goal wasn't to go big. It's just to find value and not have any redundancy with these positions. So here's the offensive staff. We'll leave it there. Alex Van Pell, offensive coordinator, TC McCartney coaching quarterbacks. He had tight ends with Cleveland uh, quarterbacks coach in Denver before that San Francisco under everyone's favorite offensive coach, Kyle Shanahan, Taylor Embry, ex jets running backs coach, same job. Now here in new England, Tyler Hughes, you mentioned him uh, basically getting promoted as a quality control offensive coach who worked with receivers, offensive linemen and tight ends in new England but now replaces Troy Brown and Ross Douglas, who everyone has fair complaints about as far as the development of this receivers. When you go back through his track record, not exactly inspiring for a guy who's middle-aged and bouncing around. They couldn't find somebody else, but he's the name of receivers. He'll be helped by Tyquan Underwood. Everyone remembers 2011. Uh, cut the night before the Super Bowl, my man. Uh, but the high top fade, and he's done good work at Rutgers and Pitt the last four years. Ben Bicknell, uh, he was a senior offensive assistant down with New Orleans. He's bounced around. Like if you're looking at, prototype football guy 18 jobs in 20 years that's more or less ben bicknell scott peters i mentioned offensive line coach senior offensive assistant ben mcadoo uh robert kugler is also going to assist with the offensive line and a qc michael mccarthy so 
you have assistance with the offensive line with the receivers, more experience here. Again, I said I'm underwhelmed by the staff. I want to see it come together. And honestly, even though you had Bill O'Brien, who we all sung his praises, I'm guilty of this. This is still an upgrade, in my opinion, over the staffs of not only last year, but the year before that with Matt Patricia and Joe Judge. Am Fair I wrong? No, no, no. You're you're absolutely right. And again, that says more about those staffs than it does this one, I think. Yeah. Okay. Anything else in the offense as far as the scheme goes? Van Pell, what he said yesterday. Again, I don't think there was a ton to put in there, but the fact that he confirmed they're going to more or less run the Browns offense, I think, was was a huge takeaway. Yeah. I, no, I think that was that was the biggest takeaway. Um, and again, like it's just tough because I, I'm not I'm underwhelmed uh, by the coaching staff too. But it's also like we really just don't know. It, it's it's such a new staff, um, and it's such we're in this total unknown period that or this unknown era that it's hard to really craft an opinion one way or the other because it, it just feels like it could, it could go so many different directions like it would not surprise me if we look up in training camp or earlier in the season and we're like wow like this group of guys came together it's far more cohesive it's effective and it wouldn't surprise me if it's a total dumpster fire um <laughs> i just don't know you know like i feel like there's a lot of different ways it could go and i know that sounds like kind of a lazy both sidesms take but it, it's it's how i feel about it i just don't know you know what else I'm encouraged by, though? And again, this isn't to say this will lead to any success, but these, you know, key spots, they're inexperienced, right? Springer, we talked about, you know, some of the other younger guys on staff. Covington, obviously, is a part of this, even though he's been in the system. Gerard is example A, five years in coaching, now you're a head coach. Is that whether it's even T.C. McCartney, a guy in his, his mid-30s, um, Bob Bicknell, who I mentioned, like these guys have been a part of installing new offenses in many different places. So they know the process of, hey, as Alex Van Pelt said, I'll build my scheme around the talent, but we're still finding out what we have. Like, they're not looking at tape of upcoming free agents. They're looking at tape of guys now in-house. Who can we keep? Who do we want to keep? What do we need? How many things do we need? And so they've understood, okay, we can't write the whole playbook. We probably can't even write half of it. They can't even pick a running game. But we know what we can put in and what that process will lead to once we have some pieces and then write the rest of this. Because they're going to be building a system as they build a roster. And at least having coaches in place who have done that before is encouraging, especially knowing that among those coaches, Gerard Mayo is not one of them. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, the other thing I think is, you know, we hear a lot, of, we've heard a lot about how ultimately most of the work uh, on the players, you know, who will be at the combine or in the draft, you know, a lot of that work already has been done uh, and there's not much moving that can, that can take place. And that's true that, you know, sure, you know, especially the front office and the scouting guys, uh, the scouting department, Maybe a lot of their work is done, but, you know, in terms of evaluating prospects, free agents, all that kind of stuff. But the the new coaches that are here, it's like the work's not done for them. You know, they're just getting going. And so there's obviously this going to be this period where, you know, I'm sure they I know they've already been at it is who, how do you guys that are, have been here feel about the X, Y, and Z player? Here's how we feel about it. Where are we trying to go? Like, I think there's going to be a feeling out process and a getting up to speed. And that could take a little while. Yeah. All right, DeMarcus Covington does not need to get up to speed. He has a smaller staff. You know, I think the biggest takeaway from his press conference, he's going to call defensive plays. It won't be Gerard Mayo. I think that's a healthy thing because Gerard Mayo as a head coach needs to have his finger on the pulse of the whole game. Um, Van Pelt is going to run the offense, but I think it's better to take a bird's eye view than jumping in. Let DeMarcus Covington make his own mistakes as Gerard will, as opposed to trying to juggle too many things on Sundays. And so DeMarcus Covington... Um, spoke about Jerry Montgomery, his successor's defensive line coach, just said he admired the Packers, you know, consistency, their effort. They use similar techniques that the Patriots do. I'm sure a lot of that is true. Uh, but Elliot Wolf, again, all roads lead back to that man and his experience with Van Pelt, Montgomery in Cleveland and then Green Bay, respectively. And so I think that's partly why he's here. I also asked him what needs to change to take this defense to the next level, because he said they need to get back to where they were. Uh, injuries obviously played a big role last year. He picked on that word change and honestly said not much. Agree or disagree? Uh, I I largely agree. Uh, you know, again, I think it was a strength of the team last year. And and I don't think they need to change much. I mean, I, I was I think it was Matthew Judon was on uh, Radio Row and they asked him that exact question. And he said he expects the defense to be more aggressive, uh, which is something that he would welcome. You know, we'll see about that. Uh, you know, if I was to say, you know, one thing that I would just like the Patriots to change from a philosophical standpoint with their defense is, you know, less emphasis on finding all these Swiss Army knives and the, and and prioritizing hyper versatility. You know, can this guy play 
well, you know, linebacker half the snaps and safety the other snaps. You know, can this guy play all over the defense? Like, just focus on getting good players uh, who can play their position at a high level um, and go from there. You know, I, I under the versatility, you know, works well and, and it's a good idea. Um, it, but I just think, again, like, stop making it such a huge emphasis. I agree. Marte Mapu, I, I call it players who are great in theory, but not great in practice. You know what I mean? Like this sounds so good. We can put them all these different places and then they're going, oh, he's running close to a four or five. And there goes Tyree Kill right by him in week eight down in Miami. And the season goes down the drain because he just took one step in quarters coverage where he had help to the boundary. And the corner obviously got dusted because it's Tyree Kill. You just can't afford those mistakes. Uh, and maybe it's a mistake to put him there in the first place because Mapu played linebacker in college and looks like him. But it's just an example, like you're saying, players better in theory than in practice. Um, do you think they should have hired more coaches? Because in addition to Jerry Montgomery, you know, they bring in Drew Wilkins, ex giants and Ravens outside linebackers coach. He's been around for 12 years. I think that's a good hire. Dante Hightower. Welcome back. I also have not talked about him. Uh, and then you have Brian Belichick and Mike Pellegrino. We're going to lead the secondary again, but that's still a small staff, especially when you consider an inexperienced coordinator head coach who leans on defense and obviously a Hightower. No, I actually, I, I don't have many issues with it. And maybe, maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid a little too much. But as I mentioned earlier, like I think it's, especially on the defensive side of the ball, I think it's a healthy blend of Belichick era holdovers and and, and people that you know have experience here uh, and some new voices. Um, you get obviously somebody like Dante Hightower, another player who's been here before. We have no idea whether he can coach. Like it's obviously the fans get excited about it because. He's Dante Hightower. We don't know whether he's going to be a good coach. We'll have to find out. But I just think on paper, um, you know, I, I think it's a good, I think it's a good solid staff. You know, maybe I would have felt a lot better about it if those early offseason rumors about Steve Belichick potentially staying on and sort of a, a a senior defensive advisor or quality control, whatever, if, if that bore out, maybe that would have, um, you know, been a, a, an extra thing that would have helped them. But overall, uh, I'm not too concerned about uh, the size of the staff. I think it's, I think it's overall a solid group. I agree. I think Brian Belichick and Mike Pellegrino do a lot of the heavy lifting, though, for that argument. When you speak to their experience within the staff, the players, the system, Covington and Mayo, because had they left, you're dealing with green assistance oh, now yeah. front to back. And that's that's an issue. Um, I, it also just struck me, though, if they added one coach who, you know, it, it's very popular now, the pass game coordinator, the run game coordinator. And someone asked me last week, like, what the hell does an offensive coordinator do anymore? Like, you have all of this help at the head coach's calling plays. What is Alex Van Pelt doing? Is he Does he need, like, a seat coordinator to choose where he's going to sit on the bench as things are going on? And I would just say if they had a, a, you know, I don't think this position exists, a third down coordinator. Like, someone's job is just to focus exclusively on one of the most critical areas, a red zone coordinator on defense. Um, and I don't think the Patriots do that because of the way that they tie the coverage with the rush and so, you know, it maybe gets a little bit more complicated for them between teams who, you know, um, kind of divorce those two ideas. They say, yeah, we're going to blitz, but it's man to man in the back. It doesn't really matter. And they're like, oh, no, it actually does. Um, I just, one more would have been fine if they don't hire that. And Gerard Mayo said that the staff is fluid. That's the word he used. I'm, I'm not going to quibble with one. I, I lean, I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. Hey, you know, we still don't know what Troy Brown's, uh, job title is maybe he'll uh maybe he'll go over and uh and lean on his uh, experience on defense and be a, a defensive backs coach for all we know <laughs> what did he have that your three picks in 2004 i think so yeah he wasn't bad who He's would you have taken if you needed a uh, one patriots receiver to to play a key series on defense Edelman or troy brown oh troy brown for sure i mean come on like it, it was also especially juicy that year that he picked up drew bledsoe and that the, i think it was a sunday night game against the bills at home um you know, old teammate, old quarterback. I'm trying to think. What about the current roster, though? Do you like Juju, Parker, Bourne, all bigger guys? You know, Pop Douglas, I guess, is probably your default answer here. Yeah. No, that's a good one. Uh, I, mm, that's a good question. I'm gonna, Taekwon, I'm gonna, again, a little bit long and lean. Like, yeah, but, you know, I, I don't know. But I, while we're on versatility, I will say just one more point. I, it, it made me think of Marcus Jones. Yes. Good um, one of the, you know, the things that I am concerned about with the defense. And again, like and it's, this goes back to what you're saying about how fast the rebuild can be um, and whether we have concerns about the defense. You know, I think a lot of that depends in whether, the, you know, they bring back Kyle Duggar, Josh Uche, losing guys like Guy and Phillips. It depends on what you think of Marte Mapu, you know, Keon White, 
was Mac Wilson, who seems like an obvious candidate to come back, was what he did at the end of the season a fluke, or is it something that he can repeat? But I think a sneaky big issue for this team uh, is cornerback because, you know, I, I, everyone sort of, a lot of people have sort of made the assumption that Marcus Jones is going to come back and, 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 and play a big role and be a big help. I don't think any of us really liked what we saw from him last year before he suffered that injury. I thought he had a, a, a disappointing training camp. Um, I thought the size was an issue throughout that, and we saw it early in the season too. Is Christian Gonzalez going to pick up right where he left off? It, it wasn't a big sample size at all. Jonathan Jones is going to be another year older. And then after those guys, you really have nothing. Uh, and so I think that's a big question mark that's kind of flying under the radar at this point. And maybe maybe they address it in the draft, free agency, or whatever. It's also a size issue. You know, like Christian Gonzalez looks like a giant just because Marcus Jones is 5'8", Jonathan Jones is 5'9". And, you know, we talked about Jonathan Jones playing outside or in the slot. Like, at this stage of his career, he might be best as kind of your utility man. Like, if they do want to make a Swiss Army knife, he can – and they've been reluctant to do this, spin him back to be the free safety. It's not a full-time role, but, like, when you consider him against Marte Mapu and Kyle Duggar and if Duggar returns to Bill Peppers – I don't know. Jonathan Jones doesn't seem that far off given his raw speed. And you might get out muscled at the catch point down there, but ideally it won't just be him and another receiver. Uh, it's just, you know, corners don't age well typically in the league. And so that would be my question and concern there. But I think they'll, they'll draft or sign uh, maybe both for, for size there just because of, of the Joneses. All right. The person in charge of drafting and signing is going to be Elliot Wolf. Again, the most powerful man in New England, 20 years working in NFL front offices, two as an assistant GM. For obviously last year in, uh, in here in New England, much different philosophy than what Belichick was operating under here in New England. Here's what Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL Network had to say to me in a large conference call today, Thursday, about what Elliott will bring and what will be different about the draft for the Patriots moving forward. But so you always watch people, scouts. We know you all kind of know who everybody is, and you, and you pay attention. He was always somebody that worked hard. Obviously, when you have uh, the family history that he does, it it have been easy to maybe try and coast and cruise. He didn't. He never did that. He he started at the bottom. He worked his way up. Um, he kind of grinded through it. In terms of how it can change, I would say the Patriots were maybe one of the more uh, niche drafting teams in the league, where they catch you off guard a little bit because it was so uh, obsessed with fit that they might take a guy two or three rounds before anybody else in the league would take him, and they don't really care because they're just winning trophies every year. Um, so they could be uh, a little bit outside the, the the lines, a little outside the norm with some of that stuff. I don't think Elliott will do that. I think you look at the Green Bay history, you know, some of the track record there. You look at offensive linemen that are versatile. Um, you look at wide receivers who have kick return background that are really, really good after the catch. Um you know, those are, are some of the traits uh, that, that just that jump out to me from the from the Packers and the way they've done things forever and how he would have been trained up just, you know, from his dad. So um, I think those would be a couple of the changes. Okay, so this, <laughs> this cuts both ways. One, it sounds like the unpredictability, the mystery is going to be removed a little bit, which I'm bummed about because I loved thinking that I could figure things out. And when I land five or six correct picks on my mock draft, it feels better because I covered the Patriots and not just the New York Giants or the Jacksonville Jaguars. Secondarily, though, I think you're going to have a lot of relief from fans, seeing, as Daniel Jeremiah put it, Elliot Wolf's going to follow the board. He's going to follow the consensus board. He's not going to be obsessed with fit, as he said the Patriots were under Belichick. Do you think this is a good thing? What did you make of his comments overall just about what Elliot will do as far as change moving forward? No, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, I think – and and – what Jeremiah was also talk was sort of touching on there is that the Patriots were able to get away with taking some of those those swings and not having them work out because of how consistent they good good they were. You didn't really notice it if 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 one of those players uh, flamed out or, or, or didn't pan out. Uh, and obviously, towards the end of Belichick's tenure, it was an, an entirely different story. Um, but I, you know, I think overall, uh, it, it's good for them to get back to just you know, let's let's get the best player available. Um, it, to your point, I am going to miss uh, sort of the fun that came with leading up to the draft where, you know, kind of doing the, the Bill Belichick binocular all-stars, like who's the kid that that's that plays the cross, has military ties. <laughs> and, you know, as, as you know, Jeremiah said, the Patriots are always really tough to figure out from a draft standpoint. On the other hand, I thought they were one of the easier ones to figure out just because you knew they were predictably unpredictable. So you could try and find these players that made perfect sense for them. Um, but I think it's overall, you know, it, it's a good thing. Uh you know, for them to go in in a more 
straightforward approach, not try and get too cute. They certainly got too cute for their own good, uh, you know, throughout the tenure, but really, I think, towards the end uh, of Belichick's time with the Patriots. So I think it's a positive sign. I think it's a positive as well. And look, you'll you'll miss some of the Sebastian Vollmer hits that you have in the second round. You're also going to miss the Jordan Richards if everyone going, the f- what was that? Um, and, you know, that was papered over, as we all know, for Tom Brady for a very, very long time. But as I said multiple times in this podcast and elsewhere, if you exclude Christian Gonzalez, who I'm sorry, I just want to see start a fifth game in the NFL before I consider him a big hit, even though I think ultimately that's what he will be as a first round pick. The Patriots have not hit on a first round pick since 2012. This has been a bad drafting team and that started to catch up with them in 2020 when they had little cap space and couldn't spend as much and Brady left and has kept up with them as they've gone 29 and 39 over the last few years. So if they, they just go by the board, which, okay, these might be more predictable or common picks, but you need to get better players, talented players, okay? It doesn't need to be a worth smarter than you contest. It's building a football team, and I think this will be a good thing for the Patriots, but uh, we'll have a lot more in Elliott Wolf uh, coming in the coming weeks and months and before the draft. Well, you will get to know him just as you got to know about Matt Groh and Dave Ziegler the last couple of years as I wrote profiles about them. And, you know, look, there's a ton of good reporting about this team in this front office, but he's He's someone, again, I said keep an eye on him from the get-go. Don't take your eye off of Elliot Wolf at any time over the next six months. Okay, it might be strained. It's going to be worth it. He is the one in charge making these calls, coaching staff, front office, um, draft, and free agency. Well, to that, I wonder, you know, what other sort of fixtures of the Belichick tenure go by the wayside now? Are we going to see uh, an undrafted free agent make the the 53-man <laughs> roster every single season, even though that streak snapped last year? You know, is there going to be you what see what felt like an agenda in that department? Uh, is that some of that other stuff sort of on the margin is going to fall fall inside too? Well, we'll see because you know I think they'll get to blend like you were talking about. You want to take the foundation of what Belichick did, and I, I I've said this as well and agree with it. When I say their culture is going to change, it will. But the you know the foundation should be there, right? Tough, smart players. Matt Groh represents that foundation. He's going to be in charge of this the college side. Like he spent all of his time. Very smart guy. But they're changing their their grading system, right? Alonzo Highsmith is going to come in and be a high-ranking executive in this front office. Came up in Green Bay over 25 years in front offices in the NFL. Someone who knows what he's doing, but in a very different approach and value system. So, you know, Grow, I think, might be able to blend that. But the final call is going to go to to Elliot. All right. I asked you for bad takes because (laughs) if there's one person on this beat who can sit and steep and have a smile on takes, it might go south, but right now stink. It is my friend Dakota Randall, and I admire that about you. Perfectly comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, you spoiled one yesterday when I asked you at the end of this happy hour, hey, come on, come on with a bad take. And boom, you had one ready to go. So tell us what that take was and follow up with the other quote unquote bad take right now that, uh, you know, they could be hot, spicy, but just for now, people will bristle. Let's use the word bristle at this. Well, it, you know. I would just like to say that I get a I get a bad rap for my takes in the media workroom, but a lot of them <laughs> age remarkably well. Uh, so let's just, just, just want to make that point. Uh, the take well, hey, you have receipts, to, like air them out. Well, there, but there's context to all of them. Like I think that I, I got a lot of grief, like in week two, for saying I thought the Patriots were going to beat the Chiefs later on in the season. Um, I was wrong, but my reasons for believing that wound up being right. So I, I just, you know, I can talk myself into thinking I know what I'm talking about. Um, but as far Not as the take you're talking about from yesterday, uh, you know, I think Mac Jones, Minnesota Vikings, week one starter, uh, Vikings make the playoffs. Let's, let's just take it another step further. Wow. I mean, again, a lot of this, I'm just, you know, kind of trying to make up stuff for the sake of being spicy. But I do think, that there's a path towards that possibly happening, or you you, know, you can squint and see it because you know where are the best fits for Mac Jones as a trade destination. Uh, it kind of depends on you know what he's looking for, if he's willing to accept being a backup, if he wants a chance to compete for a starting role, um, all that kind of stuff. Is it going to the Rams and sitting behind Matthew Stafford for two years and then maybe getting to do like the Geno Smith like career resurrection uh, a little down the road? Is it going and, and sitting uh, behind Brock Purdy at the San, with the San, San Francisco 49ers? maybe starring in practice or waiting for an injury and then seizing on an opportunity that way? Or is it going to a team like the Vikings uh, where we don't know what's going to happen at quarterback? You know, are they going to hitch their wagon to Kirk Cousins uh, at his age and coming off a torn Achilles? Who knows? Um, but if they don't uh, and they go the route of bringing in a veteran or maybe a late round draft pick, 
you know, maybe they take a flyer on Mac Jones. And then, listen, I think Mac Jones is broken too. But I also think this is a guy who, you know, he beat out Cam Newton as a rookie in a quarterback competition. Uh, when he's confident and going right, uh, he can execute at a, at a reasonably high level. You go there, you have Justin Jefferson, you have Jordan Addison, you have, you know, you don't have TJ Hawkins, and that hurts the case a little bit, but you have a, a capable play caller in O'Connell. I could just, it wouldn't surprise me if, if he went there and by the end of training camp, you hear, read all these headlines about how great Mac Jones was in camp and he wins a starting job and then Vikings to the moon. So. I convinced uh, you. Minnesota Mac. I'm I'm ready for it. You know what I like about this is that one of the best games he played in New England. And again, he might return. I don't think it's going to happen. I've now thrown two pens on the floor to demonstrate that point. Is just to say that he played one of his best games at Minnesota, Thanksgiving, 2022, and that is an analytics focused front office. But when you look at the history of some free agent signings, you go, that guy got that much. You go back. To these teams who sign, I mean, the first example that comes to mind is Eric Walden, who was an old outside linebacker for the Packers, tore it up in one particular game against the Colts. Well, lo and behold, who gave Eric Walden a giant bag free? That's a freebie for Immaculate Grid fans out there. Um, it was the Colts. And so teams make this mistake because the things that happen in front of their eyes get weighted more heavily than they should. It happens to the Patriots. You know, Wes Welker is a great example of it working out. It always doesn't. So if the Vikings remember that game, and look and say, that was a really screwed up season, but he tore us up. And it was really screwed up last year. I'm with you. I think that's a solid fit, even if he's just a bridge or a backup or an insurance policy, because that's what they need right now with Kirk Cousins. All right, what was number two? Yeah, uh, You know, I had to dig I had to dig deep for this one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't quite sure. So I'm just going to go with it. Patriots, playoff team uh, in 2024. Oh, my and, God. <laughs> no, but listen. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm ready. Do I'm ready. I really do I truly believe this? Like, if am I going? Am I am I loading up DraftKings? Yes, or yes, you do. Right Move forward. Yes, you do. Yes. Uh, but anyway, um, listen. First of all, I think <laughs> they're. Not, this goes back to our conversation about the rebuild and how far they are. You know, I think there are some revisionist takes right now about the Houston Texans, where now people are saying, you know, they were they were that roster was close. They had the pieces in place. I don't remember anybody saying that a year ago. We were talking about one of the worst rosters in football. Uh, nobody was that high on them. Now that they had the season, everyone says that you know they just were the quarterback and the coach away. I don't think that's true. I think this thing can turn; uh, these things can turn over relatively quickly in the NFL these days. Uh, I mean, it, it, it also happened in Philadelphia. There are just huge variables, right? You got to hit on the quarterback. The coaches have to be able to coach. You got to go out and get a receiver, and those all sound like monumental things that need to happen, and they are. Uh, but if those happen, I'm a believer in the defense. Um, you know, I I I think they're still they're gonna be reasonably well coached. I think the bones of a good offensive line are there, provided they bring back Mike and Weno. Uh, and then we'll see what happens at left tackle. The you know, Cole Strange potentially being out for a long period of time uh definitely hurts them. But I think there are enough pieces there where if you hit on the quarterback, which again is possible, more possible in today's NFL, uh, if they take one that high in the draft and then they go out and get a weapon, you know, uh I think it could happen, but again, I but the last point I'll make is I don't really think that's representative of how good the Patriots are or how good they can be. I ultimately think, relatively speaking, they're not. <laughs> they're probably going to be bad. I'm just not that high on the AFC. And I think we get into this trap every year where, depending on what happens in in free agency in the trade market, teams get people have all these takes about all the other teams across the league, whether it be the Broncos or the Raiders, and a lot of it doesn't pan out. I think you know the Chiefs got away with one this year. I think the Bills are are, are 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 trending downward. We'll see what happens with Stefan Diggs. Who knows what Joe Burrow's uh, going to look like? You know, we thought the the Jacksonville Jaguars were set up to be one of the next great powerhouses in the AFC. That didn't work out this year. Um, so I just think it's 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 more representative of the field. I'm not sold on the AFC field. And if the Patriots hit on a couple or more than a couple big X factors, you know, playoffs. <laughs> oh, be careful what you wish for, folks, because that is exactly what I asked for. It's what I got. I love the smile. I genuinely appreciate the thought that went into something that I am not rooting against, to be clear. If the Patriots go to the playoffs. This will be an incredibly enjoyable season. We already talked about the kumbaya nature of what would be the new culture under Mayo and Van Pelt and Springer and Demarcus Covington and God knows who else. But no effing way, my friend. <laughs> like you're going. I think the AFC is down. Yeah, the Chiefs got away with one. They only went through. Um, one of the best offenses in the league in Miami, who they shut down. Josh Allen in Buffalo. Oh, and Lamar Jackson, league MVP in Baltimore, while Joe Burrow was out, okay? And you're also talking about 
Aaron Rodgers coming back with the Jets. Do I have faith in the Aaron Rodgers Jets? No. no. But this was a down year. You're right. But the quarterbacks are coming back. The teams will be better. And among those teams is only the back-to-back reigning champion Chiefs. I, I think the Houston point was the most salient one that you you made. Um, this was completely revisionist history, where when they traded that future first to Arizona, everyone's going, that could be the number one pick next year. This is a mistake. I was among them. CJ Stroud, there's that pick to Jalen Mills in the preseason. The Texans yeah. score nine points in their opener, lose at Baltimore, and then make this run. And they had more talent, and they hit on their draft class. That was a big part of this with Nick Casario. Uh, and in past picks, Nico Collins, legitimate number one, third-round pick from Michigan in 2020 or 2021. 2020, uh, but this is this is not that. And C.J. Stroud and Andrew Luck come around once every 10, 11 years. So we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. But look, bad takes, a spicy takes. I mean, I think this game needs a new name. It's how many Spressies. Do you, would you would you believe this or could you be convinced of this? And that to me, I think is a five or six. Like I, <laughs> I can't get there without that much help. Okay. Well, let me let let let's just do this. Let's let's play out this exercise for another twenty seconds. Okay. Okay. Well, there are seven seven playoff spots in the AFC, right? Yeah. Or in the, the conferences. Okay. So let's just run through the teams real quick. Bills, would you concede that we? You know, it it, it it's a little shaky right now. I mean, the Patriots beat them this year. What what is a little a little shaky up there is a full on earthquake down here. I mean, everyone would happily live through small tremors in Foxborough to deal with those shakiness as compared to what they have right now, which is just a chasm. I don't know. We don't know what's. I mean, McDermott questionable. Uh, I don't know. I think I'll say this too. It's February twenty second. I'm open to it. But can but continue. But anyway, yes, Dolphins. A uh, little soft, right? Definitely, undeniably talented. Very good team. Little soft. Uh, you know, kind of created a little bit down the stretch. Jets, I don't believe in Aaron Rodgers or, or the Jets until they prove it otherwise. Chiefs, Chiefs. Raiders, what? They went eight and nine. They don't have a quarterback. Broncos, they have Russ. They went eight and nine. They don't have a quarterback. Chargers went five and 12. They have a quarterback. You, you, we assume Jim Harbaugh is going to figure things out, but they're the Chargers. I'll believe it when I see it. Ravens, well, the, I, if Bill Belichick was still around, I would have, you know, liked the Patriots' odds of always finding a way to be a competitive with them. But obviously, right now, the Ravens are a clear cut better. Browns, again, like what's Sean Watson going to look like when he comes back? I thought he was really bad before suffering that injury. Steelers don't have a quarterback. Bengals, Joe Burrow. We'll see how it looks. They're probably going to be very good. Texans, ascending team. But Jaguars, they took a turn for the worst last year. Colts, I'm not sold on Anthony Richardson. I don't know how you could be after just a few games. Uh, and the Tennessee Titans don't have a quarterback. So of all those teams, there were, what, at best five, four, five, six, where you're like, yes, definitely playoffs. You don't really have to think about it. The rest of it's wide open. So if they just have to get to the seventh seed, you know, they're in a bad spot, but it could be a worse spot. <laughs> oh, um, just remember this. Remember this. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll have you down. We will we will phone old takes exposed later, and it could be me or it could be you. Um, it will not be me. But that was. I can see uh, there were a lot of sweeping generalizations throughout. Yes, that glossing season. over things that like Gardner Minshew almost took the Colts, or maybe he did to the playoffs, and I'm forgetting. Um, it's just I I can't even think anymore. Dakota Randall, thank you. The Sultan of Spressi is coming on i think this rebuild will be uh, deeper and wider how fast it comes together we will see but the car will look very different as they try to find their way back to contention any final thoughts and everything we covered or things that we did not no no just you know thanks for having me on uh great chatting with you glad to still be around the team and, and around all you guys this year i think it's uh you know it's going to be a good time and it's going to be an interesting year one way or the other absolutely very happy to have you back read him at pro football network he is Dakota Randall. This has been the Pats Interference Podcast brought to you by FanDuel. We'll be back with an upper, uh, another episode and more slurred words uh, in a day or two. Thank you, sir. Thank you.